Okay, good afternoon and welcome, or good morning if you're on the West Coast like I currently am. Thank you for joining us as we begin RespectAbility's third installment of our eight-part se webinar series, including people with disabilities and nonprofits and philanthropy. I am Franklin Anderson, the Manager of Inclusive Philanthropy at RespectAbility. I'm going to kick off today's webinar about hosting accessible events. Before we begin, RespectAbility would like to thank all 18 of our equity and access partners. Uh, you see them on the screen there. We thank you for your help in promoting this series and we actually have over 500 registered uh, participants for today's webinar and we're thankful for each and every one of you. The, the disability community belongs in the conversation when it comes to diversity. It is very important that businesses, nonprofits, and philanthropic organizations welcome, respect, and include people with disabilities of all backgrounds in all the work that they do. I'll begin with be giving some basic info about disability, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the true talent of today's webinar, our two speakers. At the end, we will also have a Q&A session facilitated by my colleague, Eric. So if you have questions, please uh, write them down, save them, and we will hopefully get to you. So people with disabilities can be extremely successful if given the right accommodations and support. Stephen Hawking, Whoopi Goldberg, Richard Branson, Demi Lovato, and Steve, jo Steve Jobs, to name a few of the people on your screen, are all people with disabilities. 61 million people in the United States have a disability, which is one in five Americans. They want to work, succeed, and reach their full potential just like anyone else. One in four adults have a disability, and it's especially important as people with disability age that they have the proper supports and services in place to live and thrive. Disabilities are temporary or permanent. They can be invisible or visible, and they can be acquired at birth or later in life. Any person can join the disability community at any time. So I'll now introduce the two fabulous speakers we have joining me today. Today's speakers are Emily Harris and Dr. Victor Pineda. Uh, Emily Harris is the principal of Harris Strategies, LLC, helping nonprofit organizations, philanthropy, and public agencies move their ideas into action. She was the founding executive director of ADA 25, Advancing Leadership, and she also developed the nation's first disability civic leadership program. So welcome to Emily. Thank you. And we also have with us Dr. Victor Pineda. He is the president of the World Enabled Foundation and the Global Alliance for Accessible Technology and Environments. Dr. Pineda is a recognized leader in, the inclusive, uh, in, in inclusive urban development and human rights. He's also taught at the University of California, Berkeley in the city and regional planning department. Lastly, he also serves as a trusted advisor to respectability. So welcome Dr. Pineda. Thank you so much, Franklin. My pleasure. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Victor and Emily right now. Why don't you start by giving us some more background on yourselves and your history working in disability. And then we'll dive into the heart of today's training. So. Uh, please take it away, Emily and Victor. Uh, Victor, why don't you go first and I will um, then follow because I'll start driving the slides after that. That sounds great. Well, I think one of the most important things for us to think about is that really accessibility is about making people experience whatever event, whatever gathering, whatever knowledge, whatever you're trying to create, it's to make people experience that without any barriers, without any friction, ensuring that people feel like they can belong, participate, and feel included. But that doesn't mean that you have to do this any major dramatic changes. It just means that you have to be thoughtful along the process of planning, of engaging and of ensuring 
that people with disabilities, whether they have difficulty seeing, hearing, remembering, will be able to participate equally in the event. And that means that it's always helpful to have a checklist. And Emily and I will go over some of these steps uh, in this webinar today. Emily? Great, thank you so much. And um, as uh, Franklin said, I had the honor of leading ADA 25 Advancing Leadership, which is the nation's first disability civic engagement program. And most of what I'm going to tell you today comes from learning over the last five years of working in a cross-disability uh, setting. Um, I'm hard of hearing myself, so I uh, have learned through this process also to ask for my own accommodations. Uh, and as Victor just said, I think that's the exact right framing, um, that this is just about making events inclusive for everybody. And accessibility really starts way before you actually have the event. So it's really all about planning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we hope to do today is, is provide through our slides a sense of checklist, but also at the end of this presentation, I have a number of um, actual checklists, one of which is included in the uh, publication that you see on the right. Uh, Advancing Leadership was founded by the Chicago Community Trust, and I also staffed the Disabilities Fund there. So this is the document I'm most familiar with, but there are many others out there. And as I said, there'll be some links at the end of this presentation. Uh, the guide on um, renewing the commitment is a much broader guide that talks about not only event accessibility, but many other things that impact nonprofits. It's available free on the web, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, as I started to say, accessibility begins way before the event and is not only key to planning a successful event, but planning is key to accessibility. Um, we're not going to go into great detail because I know there are other uh, webinars planned on incorporating accessibility in all of your materials, um, but we'll mention that as well. So next slide, uh, just a reminder that this is what we're going to go through. The agenda for today will be to talk about invitations and materials to share in advance, and then venue selection and setup. Uh, and I'll drive the slides and then Victor will be sharing some personal stories and insights um, into uh, actual events that he has led and participated in. Um, so next slide. The place to start and what gives your participants the big picture of welcoming and accessibility is really the first thing that they see about an event, which is gonna be your invitation. Um, this is also true for your registration form. Uh, so you see on the right side of the slide an actual invitation that has been used for advancing leadership and the two yellow arrows in the middle um, were not on the invitation, but they point to the language on the next slide um, that is just a very simple statement about how to request accommodations. So basically, um, you wanna make sure that all of your materials let people know that they are welcome to request accommodations and to do that with a real name of a real person. Um, the language that we're suggesting here says to request accommodations, please either include the request in the RSVP form or contact a name at a phone number and an email. The reason we highly suggest this is that people with disabilities will be accessing information in different ways. 
Some are going to be more comfortable on the phone, uh, such as somebody who may be uh, blind or low vision. Others um, will be more interested uh, in emailing. Um, and giving a person's name as opposed to just some phantom mailbox gives people a sense that there's some accountability and some ability to really connect and describe what they're looking for. Most accommodations are going to be fairly simple to um, accomplish. Some of them may require hiring somebody such as a captioner or a, a sign language interpreter. Um, another option in your invitation itself is if you already have planned to include certain accommodations such as uh, sign language or CART, which is um, real-time captioning, you can actually list that on the, on the invitation. That gives people a lot of um, comfort that they will have what they need and also really brands your organization as a disability welcoming organization. But again, not absolutely necessary to list the specifics, but it is absolutely necessary in my opinion to um, include that accommodations language. I'll take a pause here and, and Victor, do you want to add anything about the importance of how people are invited? Yeah, thank you, Emily. Whenever you create an event, I think the invitation sets the tone. It's, as Emily just said, when I get a when I get an invitation that asks me or lets me know that the organizers thought about me or thought about giving me a chance to voice my uh, needs or to, vo to, to voice and share the types of um, accommodations that would help me participate, that would help me feel like I belonged, I immediately know that this is an event that wants to include me. It signals very strongly that they value diversity, they value participation, but most importantly, that they value me, that, that there's a specific person, you know, named, you know, Robert Gonzalez or, or you know, Emily Harris or whatever that I can talk to easily by picking up a phone or sending an email or sending a text message, whatever. So the one example that I want to share is the following. I signed up for a network, a very influential progressive social impact entrepreneurs. And these are people that were quite um, advanced in fighting for social justice issues, for gender issues, for race and, and LGBT issues. And I said, great, this is my community. They're all looking for ways to push the envelope on social impact on entrepreneurship. I'm looking forward to joining it. There's a very high membership, membership uh, fee to be part of this network and benefit from all the webinars and networking events and all these things. So I signed up. And immediately when I signed up, I realized that there's no person that I can talk to about just the simple, simply ensuring that I can uh, participate. And it was something, for me, it's I use a electric wheelchair and I use a machine to help me breathe. And so I... I really can't. Um, I really can't go to any place that would even have one step, because my electric wheelchair cannot be lifted, and I cannot be transported into a room that has one step. When I show up, there are 
32 steps. I, I show up early so I can be right by the venue. And uh, there's a restaurant. And I actually, I forgot to say, because I, I called the restaurant to ask, is the restaurant accessible? It was. I went online and I looked at the ratings for the restaurant. Is the restaurant accessible? It was. When I showed up, the restaurant manager says, oh, this event is in another part of the restaurant that we hold private events at, not in the main restaurant. And that event space is, it does not have an elevator. It has 32 stairs to get up there. So here I am waiting outside, all dressed up. I drove half an hour to get to the venue. I got there an hour early to sort of have dinner before the venue at the restaurant. And after I am supposed to enter, I can't enter. So I call together all the organizers. And I said, I serve on the US Federal Access Board. We are the regulatory agency that develops accessibility. This was a huge opportunity for us to learn about accessibility issues at planning inclusive events. So we had a conversation and I said three things. Number one, include it in your invitation so that people can, can let you know what accommodations they need. Number two, have a meeting with all your senior executives at this organization and ensure that you put this into your procurement policy. So when you develop a contract with the venue, you cannot cite the contract as the venue does not guarantee accessibility. And number three, let's make sure that all of your um, all of your organizers have at least the, the core checklists uh, like we're going to go over today to make sure that they feel empowered um, to move forward on, on these issues. But again, this all starts with the invitation. Thank you, Emily. That's, that's a great story. Um, unfortunately, there are far too many of them like that. So um, the next slide talks a little bit more about the invitation and focuses on uh, actually the format. Um, I'm assuming that most of the invitations these days are electronic, but um, a few words on print you want to make sure that your um, invitations are clear, uncluttered. All of this is good graphic design um, information. But basically what you're doing is creating materials that are as accessible as possible, including to people who may be blind and low vision. Um, so for print, you want to stay away from colors that may be hard to decipher and just fade into the background. Um, use sans serif type fonts are usually the most accessible. And generally, in terms of um, invitations as well as other materials, you want to be prepared if somebody requests a uh, alternate format such as uh, large print to provide that. In terms of electronic invitations, you should know that not all of the platforms that we love to use because they make our lives so easy are accessible. So uh, I had an experience with Advancing Leadership. We used a particular very popular um, event invitation system for a couple of years. It was very successful allowed us to easily track responses, send out follow-ups. And um, all of a sudden, one day, we got a call from one of our frequent participants in programs saying, I don't know what's going on, but I can't, put, I can't register for your program. I can read um, everything using my screen reader up to the point where I have to put my name in, and then the screen reader doesn't recognize um, where I should do that. So I'd like to register uh, by phone. So we, we of course accommodated him that way, but we're um, very concerned, come to find out that particular uh, software company had done an update and had not um, included an accessibility 
uh, feature in their update, which we thought, oh, well, that should be easy to fix, but it wasn't. Um, this happened about two years ago. To my knowledge, that platform is no longer accessible. So, or still is not, even though they say they're working on it. Um, my experience is that Google Forms are accessible. They may not be as pretty as some of the other um, programs, but definitely something to check on. And the best way to find out, um, don't necessarily believe the company. Um, as Victor just illustrated uh, in uh, the restaurant, it could be a fully accessible restaurant with an inaccessible private room. Uh, same kind of thing, you may, may call uh, the invitation platform company and they will say, yes, we meet accessibility standards, but the most um, useful thing I've found is to user test. So to find somebody from a um, organization uh, in your area who may be blind or low vision and uses a screen, screen reader and can test your application, do it, uh, your invitation. Um, speaking of electronic, we also are careful to send materials out in advance, uh, which may be a um, uh, accommodation request from somebody. And uh, important to recognize that because people who are going to request invitations or materials in advance, which may not only be um, for uh, visual disabilities, can also be intellectual disabilities, people who need a little extra time to look at things. That's another aspect of advanced planning. We are so um, prone with uh, all of the um, electronics that have enabled us to do everything at the last minute um, to fail to have things ready in advance. So just a caution to add into your planning that extra week. So pretend the event is, you know, a week before it really is and have your materials ready in case somebody needs to see them in advance. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I, I know I am covering things uh, pretty quickly here. So um, feel free free to be writing your questions down because our goal is really to have um, a robust question and answer period. So venue selection and setup. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, Victor has given you a great preview um, into the whole issue of uh, venues being accessible. On the left side of this slide here, you can see um, our holiday event from last year was held in a great venue because the elevator lobby um, coming up to the seventh floor where the event was held uh, actually had a very wide aisle that allowed us to have our uh, registration right by the elevators. So people could um, immediately be welcomed into the event uh, when you go to look at a venue, it's important to check out all of the paths of entry. So you don't want another situation like Victor had. I, I actually had a, heard a similar story from Senator Tammy Duckworth, who was thrilled to go to a fundraiser that somebody organized for her and couldn't get in, um, ended up having to take a freight elevator. So you wanna make sure that not only when they say it's accessible, it uh, means that they have an elevator, but that it's actually an elevator that ideally everybody uses um, and that the accessible entrances are very similar to the entrances that um, people who are not using mobility devices may use. Uh, the photo on the right um, shows uh, sort of messy, now that I look at it, buffet table. Um, but the point of this photo is uh, making the food and materials at your event at a level that makes it easy for people to reach them. Um, on the uh, upper left part of the slide, you can see a slightly higher counter that was actually built into the room. Um, and when we 
uh, planned the meeting that was in this particular room, the uh, uh, people who were donating the room to us said, oh, you know, we usually set food out on that counter. Uh, that was too high for our participants. So um, making sure that if you are using um, a table that is not as accessible as this one, perhaps a wider table, that all food and beverages and other things are moved to a place where somebody who's uh, a wheelchair user or somebody of short stature can reach them is a great way to make it accessible. If you have the budget, the most accessible way of serving in this kind of setting that was more hors d'oeuvres and snacks would be to pass food, but we know that for nonprofits that's often uh, beyond the budget. Um, so we try to adapt our buffet tables. Remember too, it's not shown in this slide, that dietary restrictions are often um, a disability in themselves or can be a component of disability. So it's great if you can label um, ingredients or at least demonstrate what's vegan, what's gluten-free. Um, and also think about other room setup kinds of issues like when you show up, um, whether there's loud music playing. I know as somebody who's hard of hearing, I find it very hard to be in a networking event where there's a lot of loud music, even background music playing. Um, you also obviously want to make sure that uh, the acoustics are good. Um, this, this venue had carpeting, which was very helpful. But when you have carpeting, the flip side is making sure that um, it is not too thick a pile for wheelchairs to use. So again, checking your path of travel and ideally having somebody with you, um, which may be a, a local disability organization, um, who can user test the same way I suggest user testing the invitation. Great to have somebody who actually uses a wheelchair go through um, a venue with you to make sure that uh, that everything they need is there. I'm gonna just in the interest of time, go to the next slide and then I'll take a, another breath for Victor's stories. Um, this uh, is um, demonstrating a speaker, um, Victor, your friend, Commissioner Karen Tamley speaking in this um, event. Uh, next to her is a podium, but she is seated behind a table. Uh, very important that if your speakers have disabilities, they need to be accommodated too. So having a table rather than just assuming somebody uh, can manage a microphone and their notes um, if they aren't able to access a podium is important. And then we have space for a sign language interpreter um, to the left of the photo and a second sign language interpreter who is sitting to the right. Often, uh, People think, oh, I just need one interpreter, but depending on how long the event is going to be, they will need to switch out and have, um, have a little bit of relief. So uh, when you select your interpreters, you want to talk to um, the company about the amount of time needed or the interpreters themselves. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail on, on interpretation right now, but just to say, that um, that's a great thing we can talk about in the Q&A. On the right side of this slide, you see a, a set, a group of people, um, all of whom happen to have disabilities, seated. And um, I, this picture is here to remind me to say, ideally, if you're gonna fully participate in an event, you really should have the option of sitting wherever you wanna sit. So many times, because of room setup, you're required, uh, if you're a wheelchair user, to sit only in a certain section. Um, if you can avoid that, it's ideal to really fully integrate people with disabilities and multiple kinds of disabilities. Um, and the one other thing to mention, just as a sort of basic checklist item, is that when you're setting up the room, the um, not only is it important for the entrance to be accessible, to um, uh, wheelchairs, but also aisles uh, between tables need to be wide enough. And that 
uh, when you're measuring width, you should think carefully about how much chairs are gonna be pulled out. I know I've gone into meeting rooms and believe me, a lot of these are lesson learned from mistakes that I've made. Um, told a hotel that these round tables with chairs, as long as they're three feet between each table will be plenty of space. But once the chairs are pulled out, those three feet become about um, 10 inches. So uh, you wanna really give yourself plenty of room one of the key um, things I'd like to mention about uh, accessibility and events is it makes for a better event. I will never forget the CEO of the Chicago Community Trust standing up during the 25th anniversary of the ADA when we really pushed them to make their aisles accessible and saying, oh my goodness, I've never seen the servers able to get around uh, a room so well and so efficiently. And aren't you all excited about how quickly you've been served and the whole room bursts into applause. So unintended consequences of, of accessibility really benefits everybody. Next slide um, is another set of images just to give you a sense of uh, accessibility for people who are deaf and hard of hearing making sure that microphones are in the room, not only for the speaker, but also for Q&A. And um, my pet peeve as somebody who's hard of hearing is people in the room who say, I don't need a mic, and I have to respond, you don't need a mic, but I need the mic to hear you. Um, so this picture on the left, you'll see our speaker standing with her mic. Um, no podium, but she was speaking from, from the heart. And next to her, a sign language interpreter captioning next to the sign language interpreter and that captioning, this was a cocktail reception where, where um, she was speaking. So that captioning screen went away when we were done with it. It's a portable, uh, super large television screen. On the right, different example, you see a panel um, where the captioning is on the top so that uh, it does not interrupt the PowerPoint slide, but also um, is, is visible beyond people's heads. Often you put, see the captioning on the bottom, but then the speakers who are seated at the table are actually blocking um, the captions. And there's also an interpreter in front of the panel, but positioned so that she's not blocking any of the lines of sight to the actual panelists. So time for you, Victor. I'm, I'm going to take a breath. That's most of the, um, most of the presentation here. Um, and uh, I'll let you share, share some stories. Thank you, uh, Emily. I want to get a response to one of our Q and A's. George asks, what are our thoughts on always providing sign language interpreters for all events and programs instead of just requested, uh, asking, waiting for requests to come in? What are the thoughts about just standardizing the practice or doing it as a response to requests? Well, I think that's a very good question, George. It really depends on what message you want to put out there and also what your budget and normative sort of approach is. I think that we in the disability community um, do that as a standard practice because we, as a standard practice, engage with diverse um, stakeholders regularly. But some nonprofits that I know of um, provided uh, on a needed, as needed basis due to budgeting constraints, due to um, just the size of the room. Maybe, maybe it's just a small group of people that, you know, every, that don't have sign language interpreters, but we like to use it even if we like to use CART, even if there's nobody with the hearing impairment is hard of hearing. We like to use CART uh, at all of our events because 
we also have the secondary benefit that Emily talked about, which is we get a transcript of the discussion so that we have a way to take action upon it. So it has two purposes. What? In case somebody didn't request it, but obviously maybe English is their first language, um, they can read the conversation and be more involved than just listen to the conversation. I also have a friend of mine that is perfectly hearing, for example, but he has difficulty sometimes processing um, the audio that he's hearing. So it's not a hearing impairment, but it's a, it's a processing of the audio that he's hearing. So again, it creates another way for, for our community, the diverse communities that we serve, to really feel like they belong. And it gives us as the organizers uh, an added tool, which is a, uh, which is uh, a transcript. Now, we also organize events at the UN. Um, and the UN actually requires for any event, side event you organize at the conference of states parties to have captioning or, and, and or sign language interpreters, but actually mostly captioning. So the way that we do that sometimes is with a live captioner and sometimes it's with a remote captioner. If you have a remote captioner, sometimes the price is a bit lower and, um, but you have to make sure you have really good data connection and also a really good set of microphones so that you're capturing the conversation. Again, where Emily said, you know, hand out microphones, maybe not just, maybe the room is tiny or whatever, but the microphones help the remote captioner ensure that everything is really clearly uh, transcript. Uh, I also hear from Veronica, Moni is one of the questions and answers. Um, you know, do we have a checklist of requirements and best practices? We'll definitely be doing that. And we want to empower you with these best practices so that you can share with the venues. But going back to my earlier story, put it in your procurement pro process, put it in your contracting process. So your foundation, your nonprofit can't sign a contract with the venue if it doesn't ensure that the venue is accessible and then in terms of your own process of organizing the events, making sure that the venues also have the on the same page, same page with you. I as a public speaker uh, request uh, a require that if if somebody wants me to speak at their event, that they would provide uh, captioning or sign language interpretation. As well as if the video is going to be produced for my for my uh, speech, then it's captioned. So that's part of my speaker's contract as well. J.C. Rafferty says that if an event should provide interpretation as a standard, which language interpreter should one use? Or do you mean an ASL interpretation? Would love a best practice. I'll let uh, Emily answer this, but from my perspective, I think that you need to know your audience, you need to know your community, which is why we started the conversation with the invitation letter and the invitation form, because if you can get the data, if you can get the, 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 the knowledge of who your community is, not just their name, title, and email address, but with the kind of accommodations that would help them feel included, right? Then you have a better way of responding. Um, and that's language interpretation, sign language interpretation, and other kinds of accommodations. Do you want to answer that, uh, Emily? Or? Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with everything you've said. And I, I, when I was talking about interpreters, I was talking about ASL, but um, this raises a really important point, which is that there are 
deaf people who speak many different languages, and there are those of us who are deaf or hard of hearing who do not um, uh, use ASL. Um, it's, it's a language unto itself. So if you want to have a standard, I, I agree with Victor, I, I think captioning is a good standard um, that is going to reach a lot more people. Um, it's a little more expensive or can be a little more expensive, uh, but um, if, if you can afford just a standard procedure Captioning is great. It doesn't mean you won't need to get an interpreter because there are people who um, much prefer to have interpreters. But as the questioner points out, there's, there are other kinds of interpretation besides ASL, even within the deaf community. So there's cute speech, there's um, uh, tactile interpretation as well. So uh, my advice would be to use if you want a standard to use CART, and if you um, just really get the input from your uh, audience. The other thing that you can find out if somebody calls you on the basis of an invitation and asks for ASL interpretation, they may actually have a preferred vendor. And so um, if there's somebody that they prefer, that means that you're not going to get um, uh, dinged for having a poor quality um, ASL interpreter, which I have also done. <laughs> so. And I want to invite anybody else that has any other questions to so just put the questions in the Q&A section, which is just down there at the bottom of the Q&A button, uh, or, the, or the chat feature, actually. So yeah, please, uh, I see Eric Dibner. Hey, Eric, welcome. Uh, should a conference organizer include a list for the conference conferees to know that there are accessible restaurants and night spots that are in the area? I think individuals have such differing functional abilities that it works better for them to acquire directly with their desired night spots. Well, I think, again, that goes back to your your protocol and your approach. So my rule of thumb is, am I providing my audience the equal treatment and respect as their non-disabled um, peers or non-disabled counterparts? So that means that if I'm offering uh, conference venue and the venue is accessible and then I give a list of recommended hotels by the venue it's nice it's a small gesture to ensure that the list of the hotels you provide you know all have some level of have accessibility features built in so I don't recommend an Airbnb or, or, I mean, don't recommend a small bed and breakfast that might not be accessible per se, or at least signal the information that some of these recommended spots, uh, you know, that you've taken a step to ensure that there's a level of transparency that, you know, these hotels are all accessible. Uh, that's something that we talked about, for example, with the San Francisco Film Foundation and San Francisco Film Festival where they've got two venues for screening films that are really not ideal for people uh, with disabilities and people that use wheelchairs because the only two places in these historic theaters where you can sit is the very, very back or the very, very front. And they had no audio devices, audio listening devices or loop devices and things like that. So on their website, they never even took the added step of signaling, you know, that this historic theater, you know, would not be ideal. So I, as a participant, could choose, do I want to look at, do I want to watch the seven o'clock showing in a theater that isn't that accessible, or do I want to go to the next day when it's the same film is showing it? 
another theater that's more accessible. So these are all, again, examples, uh, Eric, of, of how to communicate the level of uh, accessibility considerations for your participants. Um, Whitney Pfeiffer asks about what considerations should we have for people uh, with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities? Emily? Um, a couple of things that, uh, that I'm aware of, and I will say I'm not, not um, an expert in this area. Uh, one is um, when you think about your invitations, again, uh, if you're using an electronic invitation platform, uh, ideally you have not set a very rapid time out on that platform. So, um, and you can usually adjust that time out. Uh, I'd give it the maximum. Uh, there's, you know, no reason that it hurts you to have them be able to have it open for a long time. Another is um, to provide, uh, to put things in as plain language as possible. So, um, there are guidelines you can find on the web for plain language that um, really makes things more readable for everybody. Another is in the venue itself. Um, first of all, to let people know if for some reason the uh, event is going to have particularly loud sounds or um, strobe lighting or bright lighting or flashes um, so that they can prepare for that or decide whether they want to participate or not. If you can avoid those things, it's ideal, but if that's part of your event, then just uh, to be very clear that people should know what they are and to have, if at all possible, a quiet room. So a place that people who may need a break can um, leave, but it's understood that's not a place for others to sit and gab and schmooze. It's really a place for um, people who have uh, sensory um, or other disabilities that require them to just have um, a short and very quiet break. So those are a, a few things. I think maybe we should um, skip to the, the last slide. The next slide just says, don't forget to do an evaluation. So, um, you know, using feedback forms so you can do better. The point there is this is really a continual learning opportunity. But the final slide um, does have the uh, um, checklists that we want to recommend to you. The first is the Chicago Community Trust Guide, and uh, Section 3 has a lot of information about events. You'll also find towards the back of the guide a series of tip sheets. There's one for meetings as opposed to more conferency kinds of events. Um, so uh, take a look at that. These are all free available on the web. I was looking for something really short and sweet and I came across this guide that the Cornell University Department of Human Resources has used for their accessible meetings and it's really a very nice short checklist. So that's a great place to start. And then a couple of more in-depth guides. Again, the um, Chicago Community Trust Guide is more general for many topics. These next two bullets, the ADA National Network Planning Guide for Temporary Events Accessible um, is very specific to events. And then the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center is actually an online resource where you can click through to answer um, what sort of anticipate many of the questions. So all of these are highly recommended if you go online you may find others. Um, just make sure that uh, they are from some official kind of uh, entity and most important, not only finding your own checklist, but finding ways to interact with people with disabilities in your communities, in your networks, and get their expertise. So um, you may be, uh, at, let's go to the next slide just, and then we can go back maybe to leave the resources up. Um, connecting with your local disability community will um, give you both audience and also expertise. 
bring in experts um, and to the extent possible if those experts have disabilities. But remember that, you know, I'm hard of hearing. I don't know what it's like to use a wheelchair. So um, you uh, do need to recognize that there is great diversity, but you may be able to find an expert on events. Um, planning in advance is the most important thing I think we can suggest, but don't let this overwhelm you. Um, there's, I know there's a lot here, a lot we've said, but don't let it, it stop you from um, asking people who you're inviting uh, what accommodations they need. And then you can tailor the event to the people in your audience and what they're really looking for. So that's, that's all for the slides. And um, Eric, if you want to just uh, let the, the resources slide sit on the screen for the rest of our short time together, um, that'd probably be helpful. Uh, this will be on the web and sent, will it be sent to participants or um, Franklin or? Um, this is Eric. Um, this presentation will be, as I posted in the chat, it'll be on our, the PowerPoint will be up on our website probably within the next five, 10 minutes after this webinar ends. Um, and the recording of this webinar should also be up by the end of the week, ideally, with captions, so. Great. Well, I think, uh, Emily, you, you really done a phenomenal job giving us your deep experience with the ADA 25. Donna, do you have any indications whether we're gonna do a ADA 30 or any other kind of big ADA events? Because I think a lot of the people on the call today, you know, there's over 150 people on the call, are going to want to find out how they could connect with the disability communities uh, in their own uh, cities and, and, and locations where they serve people. And I know that what you did the ADA 25, you really organized a whole nationwide sort of uh, push to get people engaged. So I'm just thinking, is there anything that you think that we can do to sort of engage our, our participants today with uh, celebrating uh, celebrating the diversity, but also engaging more directly with um, the disability community? You give me too much credit, Victor. I organized ADA 25 Chicago. So um, it was uh, a local or regional event. But for those who are new to this, um, the, the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act is a central moment for the disability community. Uh, so um, 20, the act was signed into law by George H.W. Bush the first. Um, in 1990. So we are coming up on the 30th anniversary um, in 2020, and the actual date is July 26th. Um, however, um, usually those anniversaries are celebrated pretty broadly. Um, when we did the, the 25th anniversary in Chicago, we made it a year-long event. There are, if you look on the web and you just Google ADA 30, I believe the National ADA Network, which is a great set of resources, um, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, there are multiple um, ADA centers that the federal government funds and they um, each manage a, a region. So the Midwest region one I'm familiar with is here at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, but there are you there there is one near you, and as a whole, they kind of try to bring together people around these anniversaries. So there's actually, I believe, already a toolkit online for ADA 30, and a uh, great moment to really recognize this civil rights legislation, how it has been absolutely world changing, even though there's a lot more to do. Um, and to demonstrate your excitement about being more disability inclusive in your work. Great. I'm just gonna answer a couple of the final questions as we wrap up. Uh, you know, the two people talked about uh, food accommodations and I myself have difficulty chewing and difficulty swallowing. 
And so it's always nice for me to see sort of a variety of different types of foods, um, meaning different sizes. Small size foods for me are particularly easier. Um, you know, thinking about specific dietary constraints also within your invitation uh, form. Also, if you feel like food is going to be an important part of your event, um, obviously, you know, people also address, you know, Gene and addresses the issue of celiac disease and making sure that, uh, you know, there's a, a variety of steps with the catering company. Again, to know who your audience is and uh, is important to sort of, if the food is going to be an important part of the event uh, and is going to be served just to be able to capture the, the, the audience's uh, participants' preferences. And then Amy talks about, uh, you know, whether a particular partner organization sends out the invites to an event and the partner organization does not include accessibility. What's the best way to help raise awareness and send them useful resources, links, or other ideas? Well, I think this is what today's conversation was all about. We've given you uh, a chance to sort of think through this uh, conversation, uh, engage internally with your nonprofits and your foundations on the conversation of events, making sure nobody uh, is left, you know, left behind, left out being proactive about engaging with the diverse communities that you serve, capturing their needs in the invitation, I think is a good way to start, ensuring that you've got in your procurement policies uh, and your internal process, a way to sort of standardize accessibility um, is really important and ensuring that you choose your own accessibility policy. And I think these checklists and resources that Eric and Emily uh, uh, have put together uh, can serve as a template for you to pr create your own uh, policy or your own uh, approach that, that then you can share as a, as a de facto, as a, as a standard approach, either with partners or with, or with venues um, as you go forward. Well, um, it's fantastic to have such a big and diverse group of people on today's call. Um, it, it was really great to spend some time with all of you. Emily and I, you know, do this work uh, with our respective communities. Um, I, I don't know if, you, I'm gonna leave my, my email here in the chat. If any of you guys want to reach out, or have any questions about what we do. Um, and then obviously, Eric and our folks, our colleagues at Respectability, um, can also provide any more follow-ups as needed. Um, so what I'd like to say, first of all, is a huge thank you to Victor and Emily. You both did fantastic, and we really appreciate all the great insight that you both gave us on this webinar today. Um, so we have um, six, five more webinars to go in this series. Um, and the next one is in two weeks. We're, we're, we're off next week for Thanksgiving. Um, about recruiting, accommodating, and promoting people with disabilities to employment, volunteer leadership, and board positions. Um, you can find all of the um, webinars on the link below. Um, and here's some contact information. Please stay tuned. For PowerPoint for this should be posted momentarily to our website. And Thank you so much for joining us. And when you close out of this webinar, it'll give you a quick two second, uh, a, a two question feedback form when you, that we would really appreciate you filling out. It's like two questions, really quick to fill out. So um, thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you hopefully in two weeks.